I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the anglo Romani Society. Uh, my name is John McLaren, uh, and I'm not only vice chairman of the Society, but on the SAF Association Committee. There is a strong link between the two, but not strong enough, and we hope to develop that link and make much more use of each other's facilities uh, and friendship. Part of that is a series of joint lectures which will be arranged by the SAP Association and hosted by the Society here. <coughs> I've been the Vice Chairman of the Society for about eight years, having taken over from Nigel Knocker, who many of you will know and remember. I'm about to hand over as Vice Chairman and as a trustee, and as a trustee, I'll be replaced by Gordon Allen here. I talked about the joint events. We've had one already, David Bennett, um, I think just before COVID, and here we are with the second. And so all I'm going to do is welcome you as the Society Vice President to the Society premises for this joint event. And I'll now hand over to Gordon Allen, Chairman of the SAP Association. Gordon. Good evening. Now, are we online? Yeah. Yes. Good evening online and good evening in a row. John, thank you for the introduction. I can't claim any great heritage as a newly joined trustee. I'll try to live up to his standards. The, um, the expression starting from scratch is something I'm sure everybody in the world and online will know. In 1970, His Highness Syed Tariq was invited by His Majesty Sultan Qaboos back to the newly renamed Sultan of Oman to take over as president of the Council of Ministers. He became Prime Minister. His first public speech, he said, we start from less than scratch. There was nothing. Those of you who were in Oman in the 70s and Dota on will know there was nothing. His Majesty had a very clear vision then of what his nation would look like. The route to the start of that vision was to win the war. But the route to delivering it was to win the peace. And the key to that was civil aid. And it's an absolute privilege to welcome here tonight Martin Wall, accompanied with Jenny's wife, by Jenny, his wife. <laughs> who between them launched civil aid in Dauphin. And they're here tonight, and Martin will tell us the story. Well, I'll try and tell the story anyway. Thank you very much for the introduction, the introduction by both of you, it's very fine. Um, I'm here, of course, under pressure from both those gentlemen to come and speak to you tonight. I can I welcome you and therefore and also welcome those who are online. I think there's about 45 or 50 people also watching this online from America, from Oman, and I think as far as Australia. So we have quite a team of people, but welcome to you who are listening to this. <clears throat> My talk this evening is really centered on the um, on the future pieces, centered on the report that I gave to His Majesty Sultan Caboose of the uh, Civil Aid Achievements, 1974 to 1980. But just before we do that, I want to step back a little bit to Oman as it was in 1970, which you just referred to. Um, and and, and, and uh, to, as many of you will know, Dota at that time had been under communist-backed guerrilla activities orchestrated from the People's Democratic of Yemen, Republic of Yemen, and it did indeed threaten the whole of the, 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 the whole of the entire area. Salah at that time was, as you see there, there's a little red uh, pointer on the bottom on the bottom is, is, is Salah down there. That was what we had in 1970. Salah Taran, surrounded by a perimeter wire fence. Umul Gwarif was a little, a little station just to the east of it, which was centered on the, uh, for the headquarters of SAF, but was centered on the old fort. At um, uh, the Dofa Jarat Chandarmi was in, uh, in um, Arzat, 
And RAF Solaris, it was known then, was at the airport. And the Z Company, under the, the uh, notorious leadership of Spike Powell, with on their provisions on the new America, his job was to clear the roads every day from Ulwar to RAF to Solana and, and down to the port of Resort. And that was a because mines could have been laid on any of those roads during that period. I want, before I go, I want to take you back to 1970 because it was in 1970 that the first part of the Dofar development jigsaw began. And it was a, a thing called the Dofar Development Department. It was set up by a man called Robin Young who had been a high commissioner in Aden in those days, but he'd been appointed by Simon Taimor to come to Muscat and be development secretary. Uh, and, but, but he had to retire. He, re he resigned his post in <coughs> March or May because there was no money and no permission to, was allowed, given to him to do any development whatsoever. So it was pretty disappointing. But before he disappeared, um, that the new Sultan said, but well, we need you down in Dofa. So he came to set up the Dofa Development Department. His job then was in Solana itself to arrange for the appointment of contractors and, and engineers to start rebuilding Solana Town itself. So people like Taylor Woodrow Town, Costains, soil and water consultants like William Halker and Partners were appointed. He was also involved in trying to draw up the drawings for the new government offices, new facilities, government works departments, water departments, and, and, and associated government housing. It, it was a pretty key role that he had. Um, there was farms to be built and uh, renovated. There was a farm for dairy herd cattle that was going to come in, royal stables, and, uh, uh, and, and also the early stages of designs for Razor's port. In other words, he had a pretty full task in Solana, and he was also, he had a job of selecting, together with Shakebreak, various Dofaris who were to then go back to UK for English training and technical services. He reported directly to Shakebreak. Alongside him, and who uh, came to, to join him, was a chap called Michael Butler. Michael served in Muscat Regiment 1964 to 65. And spent a lot of time in the Negus, that's the northern side of the Jebel, as you remember. And he spent a lot of time with the Beit Kathir and the Harasisi tribes. At the end of his tour with Muscat Regiment, he walked with camels with the Beit Kathir and Harasis from Dofar to Ibri. So he had a pretty good idea of that area. But he came to join uh, Ro uh, Robin Young in the Dofar development department. And he was uh, the first task he was given by HM was to go back to the, uh, the, the Negri area and meet up with the Mahra and Harasisi and the Beit Kathir and armed with cash and money, his job was to go and explain to them there's a new government here, there's going to be a new program going to start and, and, and so all is going to be well. But uh, as he, um, he then was then appointed really to look after the agricultural developments that were going to take place. I think uh, we all knew that the greatest resistance was on the Jabal, but the greatest economic asset was also on the Jabal in the form of livestock, uh, cattle, goats, and camels, which of course we couldn't get to in those days. But in the meantime, he set up the farm at Gazades on Solara Plain, which was over the next two or three years and became a very important part of, of the whole process. The Dufar Development Department with those two guys was set up uh, alongside the palace, right on the waterfront, uh, next to uh, the on the waterfront. The other point I also need to make in the, second, in, in the in early parts of the jigsaw is the civil action teams. Now, these were run by BAT, which is a euphemism for SAS, as we all know, but they were very important in making contact with local people. They were small teams of people. Uh, maybe three or four would go up, would penetrate into the chapel in fairly difficult circumstances. But in their team was always a medic and always a vet. The vet, because every everybody in the in, in, um, in, 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 in the chapel had a, at least one or more animals, and the Royal Army Veterinary Corps seconded people to those civil action teams. 
uh, Michael uh, uh, Andrew Higgins wrote a very good book about his time in about 1974. So that gives you a flavor of the background. The books on the military are numerous. Um, I think I've got 16 in my, in my cupboard, and that's put a good deal of many more. But not an awful lot of them tell you much about the civil development. So now let, let me fast forward to 1974. Brigadier Akerst was appointed to command Lofar Brigade, and his first task was to set out an aim to secure Dofar for civil development. This is a picture of him with myself and Caboose at Ein Arzak, which was one of the very earliest little projects that was undertaken to renew the Arzak Fanage system. Both General Tim Creasy, a CSAF, and John Akehurst had clearly identified that there was now a huge urgency to push forward a civil development program on the job and throughout the province. In 1974, there we are. I was 2IC of Muscat Regiment. Incidentally, stop the deliberate mistake state there. This junior officer is meeting the commander in chief of the army. He's not sending to the salute him. We're actually going to give him shaking by the hand. The good thing is that each end's hand is a little bit higher than mine, so I followed suit. But anyway, Chrissy at this point in time approached me and asked me if I would be interested <coughs> to spearhead a civil development program on the journal. Having expressed some interest, a week later I was summoned to the palace and together with HM and General Creasy and Sheikh Brake, HM confirmed my appointment that I was to set up a civil government organization within the office of the Minister of State and Wali of Doha to set about establishing government authority on the Jebel and throughout the rural areas of Doha. Hmm. I reflected on that. <laughs> this is quite a challenge, I'm saying to myself. I'm in the right place at the right time? Yes, I think so, but this is going to be a challenge. And all I had was a tiny little office with a little store inside the person. And I'm looking at Doha in, in, in the full head and saying to myself, well, this is roughly the size of the size of Wales. And outside of Salah, as somebody just mentioned, no roads, no facilities, no schools, no health clinics, no water wells, no government whatsoever. Wow, we've got a job to do here. So, together with His Excellency Sheikh Break, we created the Adirat al Khadamat al Madaniya, the Civil Aid Department. And the aim of the Civil Aid Department was to provide immediate civil assistance to the indigenous peoples of the province within the context of the military campaign as a policy of hearts and minds. Within 10 weeks of my appointment, we had actually built a prefabricated civil aid complex of offices and store areas on the road immediately from the palace to the perimeter wire of Salaam on what was then the main road. Little did I know that the name Rube, as the place of Rob, was going to resound upon the general for quite some years after that, quickly followed by the word I read, I want. <laughs> Tony Jukes summed up some of the situation extremely well in his book, The Dauphin Wars Model Campaign, a war in which both sides concentrated upon winning the support of the civilians of the general and which was won in the end by civil development with military action merely a means to that end. <coughs> civil Air Department had seven key priorities. Water, education, health, religious affairs, marketing services, relief supplies, and communications. Go on. Should do. Yeah. For a with this magnitude, coordination was a key to it, everything. And this was done through the civil aid department. As Brigadier Akers in his book says, the orchestration of military, 
civilian and intelligence effort was vested in the Doha Development Committee, which met every week under the chairmanship of His Excellency Sheikh Break. Membership of that committee was obviously Sheikh Break as the chairman, Commander Doha Brigade, in this case, John. The Doha, Doha Development Department was Mr. Robin Young, as I mentioned earlier on. Head of Intelligence was Bob Brown. Commander Falcon Forces, Colin McLean, who we're delighted to see us here with us today. Thank you very much. Right at the back, but I'll hit him in front of him. And myself. I think it's important to understand this particular aspect of, of what's going on here. The intriguing uh, play between what the military could do, what intelligence was coming in, what um, FERCO were doing, what, uh, what we were able to do on the civil side, how do you put all these together, the tribal implications, the, the shapely things, Shape Break was a key person in, in doing this, but we spent hours negotiating what part of the general could we get to next, and what was the, be the best way of doing it. But that committee was very, very important. The minutes of the meeting of that meeting, meeting went to CSAF, to the British Embassy, and to the palace. I reported every day, and I mean every day, to Shape Break, and we would review what had happened in my, in my sense. He would review what had happened in his office and so on. We, I would give him a daily a citra of what the military had been doing. So it was a very closely and, and, and informed thing, uh, uh, basis on which we operated. Sheikh Great himself, reported directly to Sheikh to, to Pagus, all other ministers and say what reported to through the Council of Ministers. So this was a key unit in the, in the development process. So we now had to set up government centers. And here we the process by which that happened was that once the place had been selected, the first thing to do was to select somebody to be the key person there, the Mandu. And that was decided by the people themselves. They would be sitting around deciding who they wanted to be as their leader for that particular area. It was not, nothing was directed to them. Once they decided who that person was, his name was put to shape great and he was then appointed. He was then, it was their choice. They had chosen who they wanted to have there. The Mandu was now on the payroll. He was the guy that told us everything we wanted to know, what the demands of people were. It was his job to then build up a little team of people around him who would help him in, in the work that he was doing. It was them taking ownership of their future. In this, a key of the FERCA was much involved as every other local person, cattleman or whatever, on the hill. So it's often Caboose spent a lot of time coming to visit some of these initial places uh, and, and wanted to be seen on the Jebel. Extremely important for him to do that. In those early days, many of the centres had no roads, so we had to get everything by air, using helicopters or spy vents if that was possible. So a lot of these buildings, these centres were prefabricated. This one here shows you the three installments. Very often it was purely a tent and that we had. Later on, we managed to find air, um, portable buildings on, like on the right, and in the, in, the, in the distance is a more permanent building. That's the center that hung on to every single bit that they'd been given. <clears throat> and uh, uh, to get some of those portable buildings in, we were very grateful to SAF who managed to uh, arrange for us to undersling them or to, to put them into aircraft. So once we had arrived, we split well draining water was the next essential. I have to at this point point out that military engineers were invaluable in putting this together because they were the people who could who would produce the, the tracks and access in which to get in. In fact, the Royal Engineers, I was just reminded this evening did in fact have their own drilling rigs and did help in the very early stages of putting this together. Together, But once we had drilled some wells, we could then develop the water troughs for the cattle. 
expertise was provided by Sir William Halker and partners who had their offices on Salala. And the average boreholes at that time were two to three hundred meters in depth, and the, the deepest being eight hundred meters. So a fairly substantial piece of drilling. Over and over of that was the renovation of all the natural water resources that exist on the Now Many of these have been destroyed during the war and by uh, radioactivity, but it's important to, 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 to redevelop those so that we could gather water uh, for, uh, on local local areas. I put in my, what I call my bold man, um, as you see on the, on the left there, um, that's a, 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 a Jabali, I, I don't remember his name, but he's, he's wearing his Jabali and haggle, and, uh, which is a plaited, uh, plaited leather uh, rope that goes around his head nine times. But the point I'm trying to make here is we now have got people helping to do it themselves. There was self-help in here. There was energy. There was ownership. We're, we're getting people to re, re, become involved and have a sense of pride in what it was in their own country and what we could do to help them. So the materials were provided by us by air, and they were beginning to do work themselves. There's another picture of that, another one. Which you can see how big some of those are. They, they stand here really quite small by comparison. But it was a, a very encouraging to see them wanting to do a lot of this work themselves. Then comes education. That's, that happens to be a picture of, of uh, the, the digital hack. But again, early, early times to, to get tents going. The digital hack, I think, in those days had 36 boys and five girls within a few days of us having the tent there. The uh, schoolmasters uh, in Schoolmasters, I'll go in a minute. Uh, the schoolmasters, that's the beautiful son, I think, which had 67 boys. But the schoolmasters came from Egypt and Jordan. But I have to admire them for the conditions in which they had been living, they were pretty primitive, but they did a very, very good job. Not only were they teaching children, but no time at all, adults themselves also wanted to come in and be involved in it. As regards religious affairs, the schoolmasters very often. And stood in and stood in on that basis. Then we came to health. An important part of the civil action teams that I mentioned at the very beginning was to get clinics and doctors into, into the area to provide at least the beginnings of some sort of preventive medicine. The, uh, the, hence the introduction of a flying doctor service. Initially, the, the doctors were supplied by the, the Ministry of Defence to and seconded to us at civil development. At the end of 1975, we built our first lady doctor and two, two nurses, which meant we had access then to, to, to local female people, which was very important. The Vandu and others had been quietly selecting people who might be possible uh, health assistants, and they were then taken down to Salara Hospital where they were given pretty basic training on what to do, and we could put them back on the hill. And of course, so I provided them the, the, the fixed wing aircraft. I have to tell you a little story that I did, but quite interesting was Jenny, Jenny was on the on, on, on rock accompanying some of these flying doctors and doing her best as a non doctor to try and help somebody who came along and said, I've got a terrible, terrible head, absolutely terrible head. Yeah. What do I do? says Jenny. Oh, give him an aspirin. Oh, yes, that's give him an aspirin. That's right. Two days later, this chap turned up in the office and he had with him a lovely, lovely bottle of, of wild honey off the hill. Mm -hmm. And he came into Jenny and said, I've just come to say thank you very much. For, for, for what you did for me. So that's, that's very kind of you. Know, amazing you've come down. But what have you done to your head? You've got a plaster on it. Oh, yes, he said, yes, well, that's where the, that's where the pill is. You know, it says, <laughs> and of course, if you think about it, in the early days, if you had a headache, you probably had a branding iron on you. <laughs> that would soon get rid of it. So he was pretty pleased that he didn't have that in the brain. It was just a pill. Yeah, it's quite an interesting story. <laughs> Thank you. It will go, I hope. Yeah. Religious affairs. There was an immediate and interesting uh, demand 
to re, uh, rebuild a lot of the old mosques that have been damaged purposely by the enemy. Uh, this is uh, our hotel. And again, look, back to my on my civil aid, my self help says the ownership of things. We provide a lot of materials. I said, no, that's all. We can do it ourselves if you give us the materials to do it. And certainly we did in many cases. Uh, and in this particular one, we gave them the, the, the materials to, to build the trough at our hotel, which, uh, which you see in the foreground there. Where we didn't have, where we, where we had to get things into uh, up into the general <laughs> prefabricated mosques were provided, and into get in the whole, I think we ended up uh, building fourteen mosques and and, and rebuilding uh, the mosque in Dalput, Ralkush, Muxel, and Al Hota. <clears throat> Marketing services during the initial aid of survey, uh, everything was done freely. Tarpaulins, tents, food, and everything else, food, and flour, and rice, and ghee, and tomato paste, and tin, and tuna, and tea, sugar, and of course, that dreadful carnation milk that everybody had in their tea. But again, under the direction of the Mandu, all that was distributed by him under his guidance to make sure it was as, as it should be. We, well, you, you can see, what? Sorry about this. Um, the, the, the shops were running it all, and, and, and as time went on, the Flaka decided they'd take over some of these shops and run them as, as an um, a, a, a enterprise, an economic enterprise. And it wasn't long before we saw clothing arriving, schools, uh, shoes, transmitter radios, and gadgets from Moscow, so the Gulf began to appear. In other words, we've got a little bit of, of, of commerce going on here. Western area. I particularly want to mention Western area because in the final stages of SAC's campaign, in, within, within 48 hours of Rakut and Dalkut falling back to, to uh, the army, civil aid was there with its landing craft to, to bring in materials for them to commence the rebuilding of those villages. Five shakes that had been prepared in ahead of the, the, take, the retaking of the villages were also reappointed back there to then control the whole development of that area. In, 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 in effect, we managed to provide uh, materials to repair 63 houses in Rakyot and 52 in Dalkut, which, uh, and together with the rare more supplies of the air, in the area. Hadrafi became the, the, the welcome home center. This was centered right on the, uh, well, more or less on the, on the Yemen border, below Sarfait, where Arthur said Sarf had taken it back. It was the welcome center for those returning from PDRI. And, and through that center, about 1,450 people came through. <coughs> they were welcomed, they were given food and, and, and clothing and everything they wanted. The clinic was established, the flying doctor services in there. The names of those who were coming back were all sent back to do it uh, to the headquarters, um, uh, Sheikh Brake's office, so that people could then uh, receive uh, um, financial assistance. The military engineers, back onto them again, were invaluable at, the, at that end of the uh, 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 to, to put in water supplies from, from the existing wells that were there and really improve the system so, so that there was a real welcome for people to come. 1977, there was an extraordinary cyclone that took that hit Dofar, a very serious one. In fact, 102 people died, and a lot of water was flooding around the place. But the United Nations stepped in uh, and provided a massive amount of supplies for us. Most unusual for, in fact, it's the first time that UN actually stepped into this part of um, Arabia to do any form of assistance. And I can only think. That they had been previously very interested in, in what what Oman was doing to, to, to resolve the situation. So they incidentally, in those days, um, had a quite a, a substantial number of vehicles. We had about 70 Land Rovers, I think, and 16 three tonners and half a dozen water bouncers. So we had a fair amount of uh, equipment to move stuff around. Then came the roads. 
I've already mentioned that an awful lot of this was done by the military engineers uh, in, 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 in building access tracks and, and until such time as we could then pass on to the, more, the, the uh, Ministry of Roads and Transport, and of course, that's the, the Salada Road. And the thumb rate was thumb rate to Salada Road. I've already mentioned the importance of uh, the Navy and the Air Force. This is lifting um, materials to down cut off Al Santana. I think we lifted, or South lifted, around 1,300 tons of materials. That's quite a job to do. Um, and uh, in, in a very short space of time. And we're very grateful to, to what they did. It was important the whole coordination of Army, uh, of, of, of Air Force, and, and, um, and the Navy was all sent to our, our, from our office. Uh, a, we dealt with the Air Liaison Officer in, in headquarters, Dover Brigade, and every day we would submit what we thought we needed for, for building things, but that had to be dovetailed in with what the military's own requirements were. And I think you'll find that uh, we ended up probably moving, moving uh, one, something like 1,300 people a month, and suddenly something like 250,000 uh, pounds of, of material by air during that period. Quite a substantial amount, but when we didn't, we also made use of, I'm sorry, this is not clicking through. Local DAOs, uh, we made use of them for the coastal villages. Again, it's, it, we employed them to do it, it gave a, a financial development to them, uh, and they became part of the program. Communication groups, communications, we had uh, civil aid, pretty primitive sort of uh, head, um, communications with all the government cells. They were formed up so we could get messages backwards and forwards, and then it was later on, it was. In, in, uh, improved into a much more sophisticated one, which was centered on the wildlife office. Agriculture and fisheries, I mentioned the greatest asset uh, was on the general was cattle and, and so on. And so here we are trying to establish some sort of development between the two, and a program of buying of bull calves from the, 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 the general and taking them down to Michael Butler's Gaza and his farm was a very key part of this. The, I think in the, in, in the end, we were, in 1975, we managed to move 430 cattle. In 1976, 500 cattle. 520, I think, from it. But not an economic venture because we could get cattle imported from Somalia and goats from Somalia at half the cost, but on the hearts and minds of an uh, 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 initiative here. So, Forget all that, this is political expediency. But I congratulate Michael Butler on getting that farm ready so that that program could develop and we could help moving cattle down into the south. I recommend uh, Michael Butler's uh, uh, diary notes, which are now uh, lodged in St. Anthony's College, Oxford, if you're interested in reading that. Uh, 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 but it was unique to think a little bit about this gem all the time. Here we are beginning to drill wells. What, what kind of effect was this going to have on the grasslands, on the natural way in which life had lived on the Jebel, which relied purely on monsoons and those natural water sources? How much were we going to upset this? What were the cattle numbers going to do? Were they going to increase? Were they going to get overgrazing? There was a lot of concern being raised at that time, and, and quite naturally. What I was pleased to see when I went back in December, which is my first time when I went back, I was delighted to see that actually the cattle were in extremely good condition, the grassland was in good condition, and some of those fears, I think, people who had it at the time would be delighted to see what the situation is today. Sardines were a very important part of the protein diet for, uh, for, for, for the cattle in June, January through to June when the next monsoon came. And, and this was quite a hive of industry, in, in particular in Taka. We helped to move some of those sardines up the, up the hill. I don't think South uh, Terra Bikina put them in the aircraft. <laughs> it's just fair enough. So we had them in our know, here. <clears throat> Koryamori Islands. You will uh, aware that there are five islands there, which only one is inhabited. 
a sharp-eyed uh, British merchant captain called Captain Ord in about 1850 discovered that there was an awful lot of guano on two of the islands. And what a good idea if we could start harvesting it. I think Lord Clar Clarendon was foreign minister at the time, and he instigated the cessation of the islands to the crown. Sultan Said bin Sultan gave them to us in 1854 with open generosity and refused any payment whatsoever. It's reputed that uh, Clarendon, in a moment of embarrassment, managed to look around the embassy in Bahrain by the snuff box, which he sent to the Sultan. What happened to that snuff box, I don't know. But, uh, but 26,000 tons of guano was done the first year and 14,000 uh, 14, the next year uh, until like 1861 when, when the license was terminated. Now, after they were officially uh, administered um, in, from Aden, and in 1967, when Britain withdrew, the islands were gifted back to the Sultan. Following a visit to Korea, we together with HM and, and Sheikh Brick. We similarly were asked to rebuild the houses that were there. And those are the houses. They were stone wall structures roofed with driftwood and seawood. The buildings were huddled together, making spreading of disease fairly dominant, and there was a lot of TB at, 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 at the time. So we Oh, sorry. Produced newer houses, uh, a little mattress for the uh, Nairwali, uh, a little clinic. We, we extended the runway so we get the flying doctor service in there and, and general improvements to their lifestyle. Uh, we also include a freezer plant for fishing because that was that, the, the, the main industry they had. The, the caboose had given them a, a dial in which we then installed the freezer unit, so at least they could get the economy going. A little sideline which Sheikh Bray came up to them was you know, they need new blood on the islands. So he introduced a like, very, very interesting little financial incentive to then to go over to the mainland to select a new wife, and therefore they got paid for doing it. So that brought new blood in. Uh, my, my notes is upside down, it's not the correct way. So here we go. PR or PSYOPs in the present period is a very, very important part of everything we do. From the very beginning, we produce all sorts of little leaflets and, uh, in Arabic and, and in English, and this bit, but they were distributed throughout every single civil aid and any every flying doctor service constantly updated to let the whole world know what was going on and what they could be involved in. And, and a lot of these were really on that one that opens up here and it tells all about the visits of people from Sheikh Brake to the, 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 the Sultan and so on. But these were very, very valuable in, 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 in making people understand that we were here on their behalf to do things for them. Too far. Executive team, I need to just pay tribute a little bit to the people who were there. The Humanis themselves in, in, in the uh, civil aid office took huge responsibilities of, uh, on, on all, all areas. And I can mention one or two, for example, uh, Mohammed uh, Said Salim al Umri, who was therefore from the, the, the digital hackmeet in the San area, but he uh, was responsible for looking after the Western area. And they accepted him. It's interesting you can use people from one side of the jail to the other. And he became the source of people in the West who were processing some of their, their requirements. So I found that very innovating. Um, Ali Awad Mubarak, who was Al Shantri, who was, was, was instrumental in, in, in the central jail, was really Shantri from Dar es Salaam, but hugely important to, to what we were doing. Ahmed Mofson al Ghalib al Shamfri, again, he'd been to England and began, trained and, and came back and did a huge amount of work across the jail. Our other executive, and sort of expatriate, um, Trevor Henry, was in the early civil action team and for, for, for a while. 
I didn't stay with for too long, but he went on to other things. Robin Huntington was stationed up in the Nate and looked after all those the wells up there until he handed over to another environment in town at Harris. Sean Brogan, who was again an SAS and actually won himself a military cross in, 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 in Oman, one of the very few key gallantry medals, but he came and joined us in logistics and then went on to command the uh, special forces, the, the Lavender Hill one. He brought with him uh, his, his wife, Dr. Catherine Brogan, who was an ideal doctor for the flying doctor service. Paddy Hoon, another engineer, looked after all the coastal villages and the fishing boats and the dowries and so on. Um, Gareth Hardwick was another engineer who helped us in the early stages of, our, uh, of some of the, the engineering works. Peter Sichel, again, had been um, a, a member of the civil action team in 19, I think 1971, he'd been in Tarka, but he came and joined us to do what was an extraordinary piece of work, was to actually create a population census of the jungle. It took him probably nearly three years to do that. But he looked at all the boundaries, the, the permanent settlements, the seasonal movements, and the general population, highly useful for, 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 for as we're moving forward into development general. His uh, uh, records are also lodged in St. Anthony's College, Oxford. We had attached to us at one point Miranda Morris, who was a scholar in Arabic from St. Andrews University, huge amount of research she did on Jabali and Mahra and Sakutri languages, which are all interlinked with some of the Jabali stuff. And she, with Professor Johnson, the School of Oriental Languages, contributed significantly to the production of the first Jabali lexicon. She uh, also survived a rather unfortunate accident uh, um, in, in, in the Shrine Flying Doctor Services, which crash landed having just taken off. I'm glad to say that she was okay, and so was, her, was one person was killed, but I think the plane had taken off and just skimmed onto the water. But that's about the only um, serious accident we had in civil aid, but having lost a defendant, there we are. Oh, there's one other team member that I need to mention, I think it's, and that's Jenny, <laughs> who, who, who was there from the inception, so I had the opportunity to thank her for her support in driving forward the civil aid program from its inception. She turned her hand to operating the radio network in those early days. That must have been learned from her time with the Fannies in London and Scotland in setting up radio networks in the UK. She helped to coordinate all the movements of the aircraft and the flying doctors and, and teach other airlines to then take it over and deal with people like the ALO in headquarters. She scripted an awful lot of our publicity um, news things and made sure our little publicity department was doing all that as well as it should do. We even had moments when we were dictating the DDC minutes in bed, can you believe it? But anyway, we're here. Um, that's not, that's that was okay. She'll she helpful in, in, in hosting all the guests that came down, and many, many official guests that came from the UK and other parts of the, the wide, wide world, from people like Maggie Thatcher to Wilfred Thessinger and many others, great and small. And in between that, managed to find time to produce two of our three children. You see who's here at the moment. Today, managed to accrue, I'm not quite sure how she did this, but she accrued more helicopter hours flying in Dofar than she did fixed wings between London and Muscat. I didn't quite work how that happened. Uh, but James, our son, was born in, in uh, Salala Hospital, and I think that's probably one of the first, if not the first, European to be born there. But thank you for your enthusiastic and undoubted contribution. More importantly, to be my brick. So, where are we up to now? I've done that. Right, so by the end of the war, what have we got? 21 Jebel centers, Tawiyat and Hadrafi. 14 from Burkina Shahar to Shalim. Burkina Shahar, of course, is now part of Yemen. 12 from Dalkut to Shwaimir and the Korean Warrior Island. Wells drilled, 32 in the net, 26 in the general, seven and a half million is what we spent on that roughly. 
access tracks in those early days. Again, hugely thank you to the military engineers, about 160 kilometers. Flying doctor service was then operating in 35 centers. Schools, we had 21 on the general, 12 on the coast, and five in the net. This is the point at which civil aid, in theory, was the government on the hill. Everything was going through that. The time would now come in 1977 to begin to hand over to the ministries. And now, as they began to come down from Muscat and establish themselves in Salah. So, this is me talking to the uh, Minister of Education, the Director of Water in General, and, and the, the General Water Affairs, and uh, the Wali. And we're handing over these centers to the respective ministries. Education to obviously to the Ministry of Education, Health, and so on. And I'm very pleased that the uh, uh, Ministry of Health, I mentioned Hugh um, Brand Morris, but Hugh Morris had, had actually joined the Ministry of Health at that time. I was very comfortable that he was there for help and so on. So, in future peace was civil development. And that is the mega permanent center. That's the first one we produced much better on the big scale uh, to Tariot in 1978. Instead of the little complexes we had, it had an accommodation for the Nayawali Nye now. We've moved up from Mandus to Nayawali. This office and his mattress is a clinic with a six bed maternity unit in it and facilities for health systems to stay there. The school had six classrooms and administrative offices, a mosque, Asker accommodation, kitchen, reception facilities, accommodation for maintenance staff, such as water engineers, and technical staff, blocks of shops, and power supplies. Then uh, if you go out there now, there are seven of these units on, on the far <laughs> on the job. Quite an achievement. And the money for that, which is uninteresting, 16 million reals for that came from Saudi Arabia. In other words, the world about us is wanting to play a, play a part in what they've seen has been an extremely successful operation. The Kuwait Development Fund came in, and all the roads that you see today, which we designed around 78, uh, yes, 1978, 79, those are now, and that was funded by a huge amount of money from the Kuwait Development Fund. Important that the world at large outside Iran was wanting to contribute to what had been a very successful campaign. So I need to just close by quoting Colonel Tanu Jeeps again. The civil aid department was the one new lesson the Dofar campaign provided in the study of counter-revolutionary warfare. If the people were to come across the government and give information about the enemy, that information was needed immediately and not six months later. The government had to be able to demonstrate immediate bounty. The civil aid department seldom had executive staff of more than three or four, but its impact on the war was enormous. And before the end of the war was over, the civil aid department fingers reached pra into practically every body in the chapel. Thank you for telling me, Jeeps, for that. I told you that my this, this talk was centered around my, my report to HM, and I would just like to quote two paragraphs from it. Your Majesty, I should like to take this opportunity to express my thanks to all units and elements of Your Majesty's armed forces, without whose support the successful civil aid program could never have been launched or achieved. The cooperation and integration of military units and military personnel with the civil government and the private sector stands as a unique example of cooperation and determination by all concerned to work for the benefits of an improved standard of living in the Jebel and the rural areas of Tofar, made possible by the personal guidance and leadership of Your Majesty. From a personal point of view, it is not possible to thank all those who have been a part of the civil aid team on all those private individuals with whom I had the privilege to work alongside. From the unfailing strength and support of the late Sheikh Great. To the warm affection of many Iranis, it has been an unquestioned honor to play a very small part in helping the great task of building a new Dofar. 
And I'm sure some of you in this room will react in the same way as I do. And not to mention also those who gave their lives to making this all possible. Thank you for listening. So it's gone on too, it's gone on too many. That should be. Just go back one. But go back. That's it. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody's got any questions or whatever? Not, not, not heckling from the back, but yes, why do I ever say that? Thank you very much for that. Um, one thing in our sort of Afghanistan era days of campaigning for British military that we struggled with was measuring effect uh, of what we were trying to do and how that was being received or not by the populations we have influence. Um, just with that in mind, Anything from, from your perspective, from your campaign, um, relating to measuring of effect, where you were you expecting to be able to know how that aid was progressing in government efforts, how those learnings were changing the situation? I'm not sure what we were, really. I think we were just reacting as, as, as it's a, it's a plethora of requests that were coming in. It was how do we actually meet with them and, and meet those requests? Um, I think I was pretty overwhelmed by the speed at which the, they came forward and, and the demands that they brought, and that put pressure on us, military uh, and, uh, and intelligence, to actually know how to handle it. So at times I thought, we're way behind, we're not, we're not keeping up with this. Uh, I'm not sure I've answered your question really, but it was measuring it was quite a, a difficult thing to do. I think we were so busy getting on with it, I didn't have time to measure whether how successful it was. All I can do is measure now at the end of it. Sure. Um, Martin, uh, if I could just ask two questions, I think that, that would be really great. But um, I'm well aware of the fact that the GoFar campaign, and I was there at the time, seemed to be modelled on the, um, the the same campaign in Malaya in the 1950s, and to a limited extent on, on uh, Kenya. By contrast, the British experience in um, Basra and in Afghanistan, where similar attempts were made, didn't seem to work. So, from your perspective, and you may have half answered the question already, but from your perspective, what made the key difference in Doha? That's question number one, if I know. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, I, I well remember watching the members of the Doha Development Committee going to their meetings. How did you deal with any lack of consensus on the part of the members of the committee? Right. The first one, uh, <coughs> sorry, yes, yeah, that it, yeah. Uh, I think Malaya was probably more accurate way of looking at how hearts and minds worked. I, I've not read an awful lot, but I was in Malaya for a while and, and looked at how they did it there. And I think there was a, co a, a correlation between what we were doing in Oman and Malaya. But up in Afghanistan and uh, those things, it was a very different scenario, which I can't comment on. I wasn't there myself. But I don't think they had this connection from a ruler. What was the ruler in, in, in Afghanistan? I'm mean, never quite sure because it kept changing. So there was no key person such, such as Akabus or even a Sheikh Brain. Um, and I don't think that we got across the fact that we're giving it your ownership to come to us. It was, I think, too much of us telling them what to do. And that, I don't think that's the right way of doing it. I think as these people grew in their own strength, they said, well, we, can we do this? Yes. So that was a lot of encouragement to that. Second question was... How did you, how did you get consensus amongst the yes, members yes, of the... Yes, the yes, the yes. We had some difficult meetings. Uh, and sometimes they would, you know, Maybe a cash would say, Well, uh, having heard that, maybe I can rethink that a bit. Or somebody the intelligence or shape break would say, Well, there is another way of doing it. And that is, if we were to go to this particular area, then the shake so and so and this, this tribe over here, if you could manage something there, that will then 
ricocheting back over here. So maybe maybe we could do it that way. So there was a lot of giving and taking. I don't think we ever ever departed and say, I can't do it. There was always some way of trying to find a way around it with those those people sitting there. It was quite difficult, but it was it was okay. Yes, sorry. Yes, Martin, uh, we were in Master Regiment together. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're never quite clear how large a force the enemy was. And I didn't know what the, the actual population of the Jebel was. Did you come to a conclusion about that? The population of the Jebel uh, came to that after that population census. It came to around 40 to 45,000 40 45, 45, people. And I think that's probably not far off because I've got a lot more uh, information later on in life and, and, and I've seen a much bigger breakdown of the tribal areas. So I think that was probably not far off being correct. And the first part of your question was... Well, what was how much <laughs> what was the population of the enemy, do you think? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that. Can anybody else, would anybody like to mention it? Anybody else like to come up with a, a, a swap on that? Right? No, I would say I didn't all the <laughs> of the book here, Martin, because we have a question online. Oh, yes, it's, you know? it's from Will Week, who is online service at the moment, and he's just run a very successful tour window for one like our visit previously. He said it was obvious to us all what a key role civil development played in the overall strategy. But it feels as though it's a lesson we learned, it wasn't a lesson we learned at the time. But if we did, we seem to have forgotten it. No surprise there. Yeah. This question is where do you think it should sit as a responsibility nowadays with Ministry of Defence, SCDO, or elsewhere? Thank you, Will. Where it should sit, really? I don't think there's an easy answer. There's an easy answer for that. Would you like to offer one? No, it's on behalf of. <laughs> I know, I don't, I don't think I. I <laughs> I think it is part of the military in the Sorry, it's gone. Well, I just offer it to anywhere that's not the obvious. Probably well. Which is what you went on. I think the answer was yes. Can I take that up for you, Martin? I think the issue here that we've always faced is not recognizing this was possibly the only really successful counterinsurgency operation in our lifetime. And certainly the only successful building of a nation or helping its structure itself in our lifetime. Yeah. And what came to me listening to you talk, and that's the second time I've heard you talk tonight, it's immensely more detail. Thank you for that. Is that there was a clarity of leadership, an uncluttered chain of command, absolute clarity about national objectives, yeah, and the ability to resource it properly. And those are the key things that have come out for me. So I'm not sure the question is where should it lie, although I think Will's asked a very good question. But how do you affect that in a democracy with so many hands in the pie? Yeah, and there's no easy answer to that. There's, there's no, I suppose it sits anywhere, it sits somewhere alongside SAF because the two are inter interwoven, as I said in my letter to HO, you know, without SAF, we couldn't have launched it, we couldn't have made it, made, made it work. But, uh, but equally, you know, the two are intertwined so carefully. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Oh, would you? There I ask the question, Martin, um, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can ask you a question about how you got the helicopter out. <laughs> well, they're fine. Um, he, he painted an extraordinary picture um, of um, a fantastic example of um, Her Majesty's government working hand in glove with His Majesty the Prince's government, um, you know, supporting each other, but critically at the invitation of the Omani government and the HMG are paying pay a, a, a supporting and advisory role. So often today, we find ourselves in a position where we are acting in coalition with others, Americans, NATO, whatever, um, uh, either, either with or quite often without the invitation um, of, of the government. And, um, and so I suppose so the, the, the difficulty, and perhaps it relates to the questions that, that the gentlemen here have asked, is, you know, is, is how, how, do we, how do we feed in the, um, how, do, how do we deal with the, 
their hearts and minds and everything else when, when we're operating in a, in a coalition. Um, but my question on, on, on this is, is um, how did you deal with third country, other third countries wanting to, to play a role or express interest? How did you manage their, that, that coordination with other nations, you know, the Americans or the United Nations you mentioned? Um, did that all come uh, through, through you as well? We've dealt with it by not allowing them in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's probably, I'm not sure where you can record that, but anyway. Uh, I mean, there was very little American involvement. They, they certainly made noises, but we were better off doing it ourselves, I think. Jordan, I mentioned Jordan and Egypt from providing a limited amount on, on the educational side. The Gulf parts played very little uh, uh, involvement. Iran, of course, did, uh, did for providing. Uh, Military support, but then Kaboos had a very interesting relation, and, and, and Oman still has with, uh, with uh, Iran. And I think the answer is we kept it in house very tight, and not too many people putting their finger into the pie and making a lot of it. So we were very lucky with that point. Because in some other areas of the world, uh, of the world with Afghanistan or Kuwait or even what's going on in Ukraine, now, there's too many people in there to try and get. A whole of it, so we were very lucky that it was a nice little closed shop. Mm -hmm. That answers the question. Well, I have a question online again, if I can. And it's about you, I'm afraid. Uh, from Matthew Wright, who's in Salon at the moment, he's actually a lot of committee members. Sorry, one of our committee members. I'm having to use this so it gets out online. Martin's been gracious about the capabilities of those with whom he worked. But what personal characteristics does Martin think he particularly required? To allow him to achieve so much in total. It was a charm, patience, <laughs> robustness, and all of the above. And what would he recommend for people facing this sort of challenge? That's a lot of questions. Thank you, Matt. I'll tell you one thing that's patience, that's for sure, because uh, there are times when you're like, oh, really, I tell him again, you know. So patience was very important. I, I suppose the other thing is really to approach people at the place where they are, not where you are. Um, listen to where they've got to, what's their scenario, try and understand that, uh, rather than me saying, well, well it, this is the way it's going to be. It, it, it's, it's listen to other people, listen to their story, find out where they are, and, and meet them at that level. And it can be at all different sorts of them. And then it's just a case of patiently putting the jigsaw <coughs> together with a small sort of team. With that sort of yes. <coughs> and one more, uh, a slightly more political question. Khalid <coughs> al-Rashi, how did the Dofaris accept development projects from the British forces while some viewed them as an invader or colonial force? I think you may have confused the fact that it was the armed forces delivering the civil aid. But it's, would you like to clarify that? No, it, well, it was all delivered by the Omanis themselves. I, I tried to make this clear in our team. Really, it was they them doing it themselves. It was they are requesting it, paying you what they wanted. Uh, Shape Break was involved in. I was just a sort of figurehead, a sort of channel where good things could be moved around, as, as were well, the other executive members. We never dominated. We were there to be of service uh, to their requests. They were in charge, not me. And that's a, a, another lesson to learn in this whole process: is you are never going to be in charge. It's they who are in charge. You are simply serving them. And that's what we enjoy doing. Could I just go back to say, but I was going to say after your daughter asked, I think the key point is that this was a victory by Omar. Yep. It wasn't a victory by Britain no. or any of the other people. No. It was a victory by the Sultan. Yes. And I think if you look at other campaigns which have recently uh, not been so successful, yeah. they are attempts to have a yeah. victory by someone else. Yes. It was the Sultan's forces that won this. Yeah. It might have had lots of bits in it. But it was a victory by Omar. It was a bit different. That's the way I would put it. I was just a, um, uh, a, a, a signpost, and that's all really, and, and a coordinator. And they did it themselves from leadership up the top and from the bottom. They, they came together to do it themselves. We were just there to, to provide that aid. Yeah. Thank you. Martin, I think there's a great Italian photograph you showed them starting to help themselves to do it. So exactly. And you made that point as well. Yeah. Yeah, how did I have this answer to the question? Right, sorry. Martin, uh, 
Can I just perhaps provide a bit of an answer to that question, which you answered yourself about where the responsibility lies? And you threw out very kindly, uh, said how much the engineers enabled various infrastructure to enable you to do your work and how essential it was. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that actually the, the philosophy is when you look at the rapid reaction cores operating throughout that NATO command, there is no such thing as a chief engineer. No, he's the chief. ECMA, Chief Engineer Civil Military. Oh. And so they've already recognized that, yes. uh, that is a key role for engineers to mm -hmm. be able to know what's going on, and also yeah. what infrastructure. Yeah. And um, the military workforce operates until such time as the civil authorities are unable to take over, which I think mm -hmm. is really why you, as, an, as, a, as a soldier, mm -hmm. yeah. started off that business yeah. and then it morphed into a civil. Yeah, 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 and, it, and it's pretty flexible as to when and how it morphs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good observation. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Good. Well, I can say this. Thank you very much. Yes, it's gone to time. So, there we are. Thank you very much again. Right. Thank you.